Therefore, it is time for question period. The member from Leeds, Grenville. Thanks, sir, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Yesterday's botched attempt by this minister to crash a meeting uh, with the Leader of the Opposition and His Worship, the Mayor of Toronto, is the sort of thing one might expect from a campus radical, not from a sitting cabinet minister. Wow. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Was the um, order, please. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, was the idea to protest outside? If uh, if we're going to start, I'm going to start too. The, the minister of Aver uh, the minister of Indigenous. Uh, relationships and reconciliation will come to order, and the Minister of Children and Youth Services will come to order. And if it's going to continue this way, we'll ramp it up to warnings right away. Uh, thank you for that, Speaker. This is no laughing matter. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Everything Was the idea to protest outside question. really this minister's idea, or did the Premier put him up to it to humiliate him? <laughs> Minister of Transportation. Well, thanks very much, Speaker. It's uh, it's always an auspicious beginning to question period when uh, the colleagues from that member's side of the house can't keep a straight face when he's asking the lead questions. <laughs> I, uh, I also, Speaker, I also, I also have to say, I, I also have to say, Speaker, with a nine-year-old and a six-year-old at home, I thought that my post-secondary records were permanently sealed. I, it's unfortunate that the members decided to go in that direction. I, I will say, Speaker. I, uh, I had the, uh, the opportunity, the privilege, in fact, to stand alongside my colleague from Etobicoke Lakeshore at Toronto City Hall yesterday just to make sure that the people of this city remember exactly how disastrous the Conservative track record on transportation was for the GTHA speaker. Speaker, whether we're talking about killing and filling the Eglinton subway or then tolling and, soling to to tolling Answer? and selling Highway 407, Speaker, we know that both of those decisions alone set this region back an entire generation. Thank Speaker, you. we're rectifying that. We're building the. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Supplementary. A speaker, back to the minister. Here's what this minister said yesterday. There's a fine line between passionate advocacy for your community and moving in a different direction altogether. The mayor is over the line. I think it was the minister that crossed here, here, here. the line. <laughs> Speaker, clearly he is threatening his worship, the yep. mayor, and hinting yep. that he should sit down, be quiet, and stop fighting for Toronto. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Will this minister apologize to his worship, the mayor? It's your comments, sir, here, here. that we're out of the line. Culture. <clears throat> to the chair, please. Minister of Transportation. Well, Speaker, thanks very much. I, uh, as I said in my initial answer, uh, we know on this side of the House that with respect to all of the transit expansion projects that are either underway right now. Uh, ones that have been recently completed or ones that will start, start construction soon. The province of Ontario is providing more than 70 per cent of the funds needed to deliver on those projects. 
and, and frankly, Speaker, in my time as in this legislature, nearly five years as an MPP, I have seen literally year after year that member, the member asking the question from Leeds Grenville, and all of his colleagues repeatedly vote against budgets that would have provided the funds and have provided the funds to the City of Toronto and to 443 other municipalities across the province of Ontario. Speaker, it takes a certain degree of audacity for that member and for Thank that caucus to ask this kind of question in this chamber. Thank you very much. Speaker. Final supplementary. Again, back to the minister. I'm shocked, Speaker, that he won't apologize. I'm shocked that the Premier hasn't made him apologize. She might as well have said the words herself. Mayor Tory is simply standing up for the people of Toronto. Mr. Speaker, should Mayor Tory be worried that the Liberals will retaliate against him if he continues to advocate for his city? A culture of fear. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. Look, Speaker, nobody in this building, nobody across this province would ever understand how it's possible for that member in this caucus to pretend to stand up and defend the City of Toronto, Speaker, when they had their chance, particularly in the area of transportation. I said this in my first answer. It bears repeating, Speaker. They killed and filled the Eglinton subway. They then sold the 407 after putting tolls on it, Speaker. We know at the end of the day, and the people of this region understand very clearly that that party took this region and this city back from the more than a generation when they last had the opportunity, Speaker. And more than that, as I said a second ago, they have repeatedly voted against the budgets that would help the city of Toronto and have helped the city of Toronto and will continue to for years to come, Speaker. At the end of the day, our premier and our government will continue to work with every one of our municipal partners to make sure that we continue to build the province up. And the province the being, Lakeshore, building the province order. up also includes, of course, Answer. Uh, speaker, helping to support the city of Toronto in every way imaginable. And I would call on the members of that caucus to support this year's Thank budget you. to help Toronto and to help all of us. You see it, please. You see it, please. New question, the member from Nepean and Carlton. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. Yesterday, Harold Brief from Toronto wrote a letter to the editor of the Globe and Mail, and he wrote, and I quote, As a trustee in bankruptcy, I often had individuals say to me that they would not sleep at night because of the debt that they were carrying. So I wonder how Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne and Finance Minister Charles Sousa can sleep at night when they look at the province's debt load. My question to the Treasury Board President, how do you Liberals sleep at night knowing that the debt that you are leaving behind for our children and grandchildren is growing each and every year you're in office? Thank you. Thank you, President. Yes, thank you very much. And I need to tell you, Speaker, that I'm very proud of this year's budget, that because of because of our careful investments in the province over the last year, at the same time that we were reducing the deficit, we have a budget that's balanced. And as part of that budget that is balanced, we've been able to demonstrate more growth than any other jurisdiction in the G7. Our growth outstrips that. And that's why I am confident that now that we have turned the corner on the debt to GDP ratio, that that over the years we will in fact be paying down the debt because we any debt that we incur in the future with our balance by wrap up sentence and I am very proud of the fact that future borrowing is devoted to investing in our province and building Ontario up. Yeah. Proud. Proud. She should be shocked, absolutely shocked, when she hears the Minister of Finance argue that debt is improving in this province. $10 billion worth of debt is not an improvement. $10 billion worth of debt is not an achievement. Minister and $10 billion in debt 
is not an accomplishment, but these Liberals seem to think so, Speaker. So I ask them, where do the Liberals rank adding $10 billion of debt this year onto her list of accomplishments? Is $10 billion worth of debt for our province's grandchildren and children high on your list of achievements? President. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite is asking a question about debt. Somehow they think that they are good stewards of managing debt. Well, let me give you a lesson, Mr. Speaker. During their time in office, during the good times of economic prosperity, they increased debt by 53 percent, Mr. Speaker. They didn't reduce debt. The member's leader, when he was in power, during a conservative federal government, had the highest deficit in Canada's history of $55 billion in one year, Mr. Speaker. They doubled debt when they were in office federally. So we're not going to take any lessons from this member or anybody on that side of the House who are not managing fiscally responsibly the issue of investing in our economy, investing in schools, providing free Medicare for our children, and providing kindergarten, all-day kindergarten, Mr. Speaker, and free tuition. What will you Thank cut? You. Yeah. Yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? We're now going to warnings. Final supplementary. Here it's laughable that this government thinks that they are good st stewards of the economy after 10 years of deficits and 10 years of waste, mismanagement and scandal. This minister himself is sitting in this place because of a $1.2 billion gas plant scandal. That's what I remember. And I also want to defend Mike Harris. One million jobs were created under his administration, not like the 300,000 that were lost under this government. And that $12 billion a year in interest payments is $1 billion a month. But instead, they are crowding frontline services to pay for stop, stop. Minister of Economic Development and Growth is warned. Please. Simply put, we're paying for their cancelled gas plants. We're cut, crowding out frontline services. We're paying for up, down, upside down bridges, and we are still paying for those scandals uh, that, that happened at eHealth and OHIP. Question. Mr. Speaker, why do the Liberals refuse to introduce a credible plan to pay down the debt and ensure that we don't have a Thank rolling you. deficit like they're hiding right now? Thank you. Uh, the, the member will withdraw. Withdrawn. Minister of Finance. Speaker, we have 700,000 net new jobs since the depth of the recession, recovering all those that were lost. We are outpacing Canada, the G7, and the United States in economic growth, Mr. Speaker. It's well regarded around the world in terms of what Ontario is offering. We are sought after by investors, topping the foreign direct investment of any other nation in, uh, in and around the world, especially in North America. We are the leanest government for that matter, Mr. Speaker, lower cost than any government in Canada and federally. And, Mr. Speaker, we have the lowest interest on debt compared to any other time in history of this government of this province, certainly lower than 15, 60 percent when the Conservatives were in power, lower when the NDP was in power at 12 percent, Mr. Speaker. We're locking those rates over long term. But the first way to, ad to address debt, Mr. Speaker, is to balance the books. We are balancing this year, next year, and the year after that, and we're lowering debt to GDP over the long term. Can you say that, please? New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. I think every Ontarian should be able to get the medication that they need. That's what universal pharmacare means. Instead. Instead, the Premier of this province chose to add yet another drug plan to the six that Ontario already has, rather than implementing universal pharmacare. Why is the Liberal government still not committing to a universal pharmacare plan that would cover all 14 million Ontarians? Uh, well, Speaker, we are enormously proud of OHIP+. OHIP+, will cover all people 
under age 25, Speaker, everyone in this province will have access to the same range of drugs as anyone else. 4,400. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, is warned. Carry on. More than 4,400 drugs listed on the formulary. Young people will have access to all of those drugs, Speaker. So that includes our plan includes medications that treat conditions like diabetes, like asthma, like epilepsy, like ADHD, ear infections, HIV, depression, a range of indications, Speaker. Every young person in this province will have full access Answer. to that medication. They need their OHIP card and the prescription, and we'll look after the rest, Speaker. This Thank is a you. huge enhancement. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, universal pharmacare can save lives. For a dad over 24 living with HIV, for a worker over 24 who's lost their drug coverage, or a mom over 24 who's skipping her heart medication because she can't afford it. Universal coverage is a must. We have universal Minister Medicare of Finance already, is Speaker. Warned. Why won't the Liberal government bring in universal pharmacare? Thank you. Dr. Speaker, um, I'm very pleased, as we've said many times in this House, very pleased that both the NDP party and the Liberal party agree that drug coverage should be part of Medicare. Speaker, OHIP should include uh, uh, should include drugs. We're taking an enormous step in that direction, an historic investment in that direction, Speaker. And I do believe that provinces and territories across this country will be looking at what Ontario is doing. They will see the benefits of having full drug coverage, Speaker, for young people in their provinces. We are hoping that the federal government is paying attention as well. Do we dream of, of universal pharmacare? where every, every citizen, every resident is covered for all drugs at all ages? Of course we do. Answer. And that's why our Minister of Health and our Premier have been making this argument for many years. Well, Speaker, dreams and arguments and, and discussion don't get us a universal health care system, a universal pharma care system that the people of this province need. Our health care system is based on universal access, Speaker. Our health care system was built on the principle that nobody, nobody, Speaker, should be turned away. I believe we should be building a pharmacare system based on that very same principle, that everybody is covered. All 14 million Ontarians should be able to get the medications that they need. That's the bottom line. It shouldn't be a dream. They're the government. They should make it a reality. Why is this government bringing in, uh, well, not bringing in universal pharmacare and instead deciding to exclude literally millions and millions of Ontarians in their plan? Question. Thank you. Well, Speaker, as, as, as we have said on this side, we support the notion that drugs, that, that medicines should be covered under OHIP. That's why we are making the changes that we are doing. There are some important differences between their approach and our approach, Speaker. Ours is limited by age. Theirs is limited by condition. They cover only 125 okay, drugs compared to 4,400 drugs, Speaker. That means whether you get coverage or not will depend on the drug that you need. We don't think that's okay. We want to cover everyone. We are covering everyone under age 25, Speaker. And our plan kicks in in January 2018. We're going to be two years ahead of you. That's two years of drug coverage, Speaker. So We're proud of our answer. plan, and, and I really do think the NDP should support us enthusiastically. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. My next uh, question is also for the acting premier, Speaker. Look, the Liberals have starved our hospitals for nine years, four of those years with frozen budgets. As a result, people are being treated in what the government calls unconventional spaces. To patients, Speaker, that means hallways and utility closets. The Premier is making decisions like she's never been in an overcrowded ER before and never suffered the indignity of watching a loved one being treated in a hallway. Instead of fixing the problem, the Premier's budget falls $300 million short of what's needed as a basic. 
Why is the Liberal government making hallway medicine even worse here in Ontario? With this Thank you, well, Speaker, this budget is all about improving health care, and it is true. We have had to work hard to come to balance. We are now in balance. That means we have the opportunity to invest in those things that we know the people of this province want to invest in, and that absolutely includes health care, Speaker. Patients should always come first. That's why every decision we make is centered on providing families with high-quality care and care that they can access. Speaker. Since 2003, we've increased our investments every single year in health care. We're treating more patients, we're providing better care, and we're reducing wait times. And this year's balanced budget, Speaker, builds on these investments by providing a much-needed booster shot to health care, an additional $7 billion Answer. in health care over the next three years. Let me repeat that, an, uh, an additional $7 billion, Thank you. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. But the bottom line, Speaker, is it will not undo the damage that this Liberal government has done to our hospitals and our health care system, damage that people have suffered through over the last nine years, at least, Speaker. Hamilton Health Sciences in my home city has been operating with over 100 per cent capacity for months. Rob McIsaac, the CEO of Hamilton Health Sciences, has said, and I quote, if they care to listen, we appreciate the additional funding that we are receiving this year, but it will take a number of years to really overcome the problems we're experiencing in the interim. We'll have to continue to utilize unconventional spaces to house the patients we can't squeeze into regular rooms. That means more Hamiltonians being treated in hospital hallways. Question. Why is the Liberal government okay with the hallway medicine that they have forced our patients in this province to experience for far too long? You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker, again, the leader of the third party is arguing for us to do something that we are doing, right. an additional $7 billion over three years in our health care sector. Speaker. That's an extraordinary investment. I would think that the third party would actually support it. So let's see what will that investment mean. It means free drug coverage for people 25 and under through OHIP Plus, 4,400 medications covered. It will mean reduced wait times. It will mean increased access to more procedures like hip and knee replacements, MRIs, optometry services, more funding for mental health and addiction speaker, enhanced primary care, more home care, more community care, and a, an improved experience for Ontarians at their local hospital. We are making the investments that will make a difference, Speaker, Answer. in the health care of the people of this province. Speaker, this Liberal government broke our hospital system. They have broken our health care system. People are being treated in hospital hallways and in broom closets, Speaker. And according to the president of the Ontario Nurses Association, and I quote, our hospitals have been starved for funding for, for, uh, funding for years. And our the member from Barry is warned. Finish, please. And our patients have paid the price as hospitals slashed more than 1,600 RN positions to dangerously low levels. The budget won't fix that, Speaker. Can the Liberal government tell Ontarians whether they think it's okay that people will have dangerously low Question. levels of nursing care in their hospitals? Do they think that's okay, Speaker? Well, uh, Speaker, I don't know quite what to make of that question. I somehow, sometimes think that the third party actually wants people to think the health care system. Member from Timmins James Bay is warned. Carry on. Speaker, I am proud of our health care system. I am proud of the. The leader of the third party is warned. The Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport is warned. If you think this is a game, I'm going to win. Carry on. Speaker, 
Ask anyone from outside of Ontario, and they will tell you that we should be proud of our health care system. Absolutely. International experts look at the system and they say we have a very good system Answer. with very good outcomes. Lord. We are making investments. We've, uh, we've added 24,000 nurses speaking to our health care system. Thank you. Any question? The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Finance Minister. Yesterday, we spoke about the troubled mortgage lender, Home Capital, receiving a bailout from the Health Care of Ontario Pension Plan, or HOOP. Now, HOOP's CEO served on the board of Home Capital, and Home Capital's chairman served on the board of HOOP. To many people, this $2 billion bailout sounds a lot like I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. Uh, one guy owns a million and a half in stock, and one company was used to shore up the other person's stock. Uh, York University Associate Professor of Law, Governance and Ethics, Richard LeBlanc, says being on both these boards, quote, is a clear conflict. So, Speaker, does anyone think this passes the smell test, even for this government under five OPP Question. investigations? Wow. I asked the minister, where was the government in preventing this, and who was asleep Thank at the you. switch? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so our number one goal is to ensure that consumers get trustworthy financial planning and advisory services that's in the best interest to meet today's complex uh, financial decisions with confidence. We have advanced forward. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. And after warnings comes naming. Carry on. So the province, through our regulatory systems, have advanced forward with modernization to ensure that protection and more consumer uh, uh, supports, more transparencies. Fisco, as you can appreciate, is now working closely with OPSI, which is a superintendent of financial institutions federally, in reviewing and monitoring this situation. To date, Fisco has taken enforcement action on two agents, but as we move forward, the federal government has taken uh, measures to ensure proper activity, Answer. and we are monitoring it very closely, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the uh, Finance Minister. The chair of Home Capital is Kevin Smith, who earns $357,000 in that role and was given a million and a half dollars in shares. Last year, he attended 31 board meetings. He was also on the board of Hoop and attended their meetings. But this same Kevin Smith is the $720,000 a year CEO of St. Joseph's Health Centre. Where could he possibly squeeze in time to run St. Joseph's when he's heading up a multi-billion dollar troubled mortgage firm? The hospital is paying $720,000 a year for his part-time work. How is having a part-time CEO affecting the lives of countless health care patients? I ask the minister, is it right that a hospital CEO who Question. should be focused on health care be embroiled in a conflict for nothing other than personal gain. Really? Wow. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, we have a strong regulatory framework in place for oversights, both federally and provincially, for regulated financial institutions that protects the insured depositors and provide for financial uh, stability. The member opposite makes reference to independent organizations. They're not agents of the government. Uh, furthermore, uh, Health Care uh, Ontario Pension Plan, the president and CEO, has recused himself of uh, lending talks and he stepped away from the board, as already made reference to by the member opposite just last Thursday. We understand that Kevin Smith, also the chairman of Home Capital, has stepped down uh, from Hoop Board. But regardless, Mr. Speaker, our priority is ensuring protection and safety of consumers and investors. We're working closely with the federal government and the regulators to ensure just that. Yes, and that's sir. why the Ontario Securities Commission has been involved. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Acting Premier. Public libraries are one of the great equalizers. Everyone can go into a public library, take out a book, use the internet, access important services like uh, English language classes. The Toronto Library has been told that their provincial funding will be cut by 20 per cent. Why is the Liberal got, uh, government cutting libraries, Speaker? Thank you, Speaker. For tourism, culture and sport. Sir, tourism, culture and sport. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for her question. You know, Speaker, it's always a pleasure for me to stand in this House and talk about the robust support that our government has been providing, providing to libraries since 2003. 
You know, Speaker, uh, over $3.5 billion for our public and First Nations libraries uh, in 2015-16 alone. Happy to announce, Speaker, that our budget, which I hope the member wow. opposite will support, but I suppose she wow. won't, so contains supports for libraries, vote. Speaker, over a million dollars in funding. Wow. And why is that, Speaker? Because the people of Ontario join with this government and the members on this side of the House in supporting libraries because they're fundamental to Ontarians and to our future, and that support will continue. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, that seems like quite a curious response from the minister when the government is cutting funding to Toronto's public library, funding that is being used to provide internet hotspots for low-income people, funding that gives kids access to books, funding that allows new Canadians to take language classes. Libraries are one of the great equalizers, Speaker. They are key to poverty reduction strategies, and they make our communities great places to live. So I'll ask the minister again, or the government, why, if they are so proud of their support of libraries, are they, on the other hand, cutting funding to the Toronto Public Library? Thank you. Minister. You know, Speaker, I'll say again what I said in my first response, that our, our support for libraries remains so best and is continuing. In fact, Speaker, last year we, re we released a culture strategy in our government that is looking at our relationship with libraries. And in, the particular, uh, in this particular area, we reviewed this uh, cost in the ongoing program, Speaker, and it was found to be not necessarily as effective, and in fact, some of the monies remain unspent. And so, to provide support to all the libraries in Ontario, which I know the member opposite supports, we are continuing to look constantly at our relationships with libraries. That support will continue, Speaker. We're proud of it. And on this side of the House, as I say again, our library contains a, bill, a million extra dollars of support in libraries, and we hope that the members opposite will continue to support our efforts to build capacities in local libraries. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Ah. Speaker, as a former city councillor, I know how important it is to have strong partnerships between municipal governments and provincial and federal levels. One of the main reasons I ran as an MPP under the leadership of Premier Wynne is because I saw firsthand how committed this government is to investing in municipalities, including my own, of Toronto. Speaker, our government has always and continues to be a strong partner, and in fact, the strongest partner for the City of Toronto on many fronts, but especially when it comes to transit. That's why yesterday I was proud to join the Minister of Transportation, City Hall, to talk about that. Could the Minister please provide members of the House with more information on how we're investing in Mr. Toronto Transit? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. Of course, I want to begin by thanking the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for his advocacy for his community and for the entire city of Toronto, Speaker. Uh, this member has been working hard for a number of years. We know the Speaker, both as a municipal councillor and as the MPP for Etobicoke Lakeshore. And just last month, I was delighted to be with that member to provide an update on the Kipling Mobility Hub Speaker, a critical project that he has long been advocating for, both at his time here and his time at City Council. Speaker, our government has proven time and time again that we are fundamentally committed to investing in transit and transportation projects across Ontario and here in Toronto. That's why our government is already contributing over to 70 per cent of the funding for Toronto transit projects. This includes projects like the Eglinton Crosstown and Finch West LRTs, the Union Pearson Express and GO Regional Express Rail. Investments that have already been completed are under construction or will soon start construction. Speaker, these are not investments of the distant past and even recent past. We are and we will continue to be Thank a strong you. partner for Toronto, and our record demonstrates that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I was very pleased to welcome the minister to Etobicoke Lakeshore uh, last month to discuss the Kipling Mobility Hub, which will help to transform the Etobicoke City Centre. Mr. Speaker, having served as both a councillor and now as an MPP for the Great Riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore, I know that the transit projects we're investing in often as the sole capital funders, are transforming communities across the city. But, Speaker, there's been a lot of misinformation being reported about our commitment to the city's transit, uh, both for today's needs and tomorrow, particularly in regards for funding projects like the new downtown relief line. Last week, the Minister of Finance revealed our 2017 budget, which contains some important updates on infrastructure investments. 
Speaker, would the minister please provide Thank the members of the House with more information on the commitment we announced in Budget 2017 and what we're going to do to advance future transit projects? Sir, transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the follow-up. Not only was Budget 17 balanced, it also contained $30 billion worth of new infrastructure funding for projects across Ontario, including Toronto. This is on top of the over $12 billion that we have already invested in Toronto Transit alone. Speaker, we've already provided critical planning money for projects like the Relief Line and the Young North Subway Extension. These are projects which our other partners, Speaker, have not yet allocated capital funding for. Speaker, when the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore and I were at City Hall yesterday to clear up some of this misinformation about our commitment to Toronto, one thing became abundantly clear to me. Number one, Speaker, the leader of the official opposition and the PC party still do not have a plan to invest in transit in Toronto, let alone across the province, Speaker. The PCs can keep holding press conferences. We'll continue to deliver on transit that the people of Toronto, the region, and this province desperately need. Thank, Thank you. you very much. New question, the member from Halliburton, Fourth Lakes, Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Status of Women. A couple of weeks ago, I asked the Minister about Hope 24-7, a victim service organization in Peel Region that is powerless to help many of its vulnerable clients because of this government's mismanagement. More than 130 people seeking care had to be turned away at the moment of their greatest need. Do you know how the government responded to this crisis? They shamefully told Hope 24-7 that they are doing too much and that they should cut oh back goodness. their services. That is awesome. This government hides behind the fact that they funded Hope 24-7 for 20 years, but the truth is this government doesn't even have a clear funding formula in place. Everything is done the way it's done simply because that's the way it's been done in the past. Well, that just won't cut it, Mr. Speaker. My question to question. the minister is, when will this government act to address the disgraceful wait list at Hope 24-7, and when will they implement a funding formula Thank that you. actually works for victims of sexual violence? Minister of the Status of Women. So uh, I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question, and I just want to say that keeping women in our province safe is absolutely one of the number one priorities of our government. In fact, that's why we launched uh, several programs on this, including the It's Never Okay Action Plan to Stop Sexual Violence and Harassment in March 2015. It was groundbreaking, and it put our province on the map as a leader in this area. When it comes to specific funding of various uh, organizations in around the province. We are looking into what's happening with HOPE 24-7. We know that there are some issues in terms of their uh, formula, and we are working with them to ensure that we are helping them and supporting them get, uh, get, the, uh, uh, get the, their programs in line and their services Answer. in line. We are motivating generational change when it comes to ensuring that we are supporting women who are victims of violence. We're making sure that we're creating a Thank you. Supplementary. Well, cutting their services is not helping them, and that's what you told them to do. Do you know that our victim services organizations aren't even allowed to help children under 16 under uh, the current funding guidelines? Crazy. The minister should know that the average age of a victim of human sex trafficking is just 14 years old. Shameful. Yet our victim service organizations are being told not to help them because they fall outside of the funding rules. Unbelievable. This is a travesty, Mr. Speaker. The government should be fixing this outrageous oversight rather than hauling victim services organizations out to read them the riot act. The government keeps saying that they are responding to sexual violence with their action plan, but they have offered absolutely no timeline for a review of services. They go on dragging out, delaying, while victims like those seeking help at Hope 24-7 are denied vital services. Question. So again to the minister, when will this government finally stop defending outdated bureaucratic processes and finally design a system that actually prioritizes Thank you. victims of sexual violence? General. Thank you very much, Speaker. Let me first of all recognize that Hope 24-7 does very important work throughout the Peel region. Speaker, that is why we have provided them with funding for over 20 years now. 
Since 2003, Speaker, our funding for all sexual assault center program has increased by 45 percent. In 2005, in fact, Speaker, we increased Hope 24-7's budget by over $31,000 as part of our It's wow. Never Okay action plan to increase funding to all sexual assault centers by 7 percent. In fact, Speaker, Hope 24-7 currently receives almost $500,000 from the Ministry of Attorney General, the sixth highest funding allocation in all of Ontario. Speaker, we have committed to reviewing counseling services across the province, and we have asked Hope 24-7 to Answer. be part of this conversation. In addition, Speaker, there's a provincial working group of sexual assault centers currently reviewing the program as well. Thank you. We look forward to continue working. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, for four decades, the people of Grassy Narrows have been suffering from mercury poisoning. In February, the Premier, sorry, to the acting Premier. Thank you. In February, the Premier met with Chief Fobister of Grassy Narrows. At the time, Chief Fobister and the media reported that the Premier had committed finally to cleaning up that mercury contamination and doing it quickly. In the budget last week, there was no money set aside for that cleanup. There wasn't even a mention of grassy narrows. Why did the Premier break her promise? You. You seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. To the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Sir, in, uh, Minister Thank of the you, Environment uh, and Climate Mr. Change. Speaker. Uh, I want to be very clear. There right now is dedicated in the budget the initial $2.1 million to complete the science work that we committed to do to determine that. The Premier has been very clear. I've been very clear. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation has been very clear. This government will fully fund and fully implement Dr. Rudd's and the recommendations. We also are aware, Mr. Speaker, as I'm sure the member opposite is, is that there is an ongoing leak, or I should suggest, I take that back, there is strong evidence of an ongoing and continuing leak at this site from the Domtar site, and that also means that we may have to look at uh, additional actions and regulatory actions by this ministry. We, unlike the governments of the last 60 years, yes, are not going to abandon the people of Grassy Narrows, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, when you need between 80 and 90 million dollars to clean up mercury contamination and you don't put it in the budget and you say you're going to put in 2 million, you're not dealing with the problem. A, a wish and a promise and a hope are not adequate. The money was not put in the budget and still the people of Grassy Narrows are dealing with that poisoning. The family of Azrea Akabi Kokopanes, age 14 for instance. Azrea died last year after leaving hospital. No cause of death was determined, but her brother had died from exposure to mercury poisoning in 2014. This is a community that is living a tragedy. So when is the Premier going to put the money on the table, not two million bucks, when is the Premier going to put the money Question. on the table to clean up this contamination and stop the poisoning? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can be very clear. The money is not on the table. The money is on its way to Grassy Narrows as the bills come in. Mr. Speaker, the cost of this may well be far in excess of $84 million. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, I am guessing that this government's commitment to Grassy Narrows is going to exceed that amount of money. Many other projects that were done in year over the last year, including the work we're doing on missing and murdered Indigenous women and many other programs that were $150 million and under, were not explicitly stated in the budget. That didn't mean the government's less committed to it. But you know, Mr. Speaker, I am shocked. I am shocked when I look back at the history of this province. You look at Amjanon in the middle of Answer. Sarnia, completely surrounded by air contaminants, or the abandonment of Grassy Narrows. No one in this House, Mr. Speaker, Thank who's you. been here should find that record. 
take this moment to indicate to uh, all the members that if anyone ever says anything that they know is unparliamentary, they have it upon themselves, if I can't pinpoint any individual, to stand and withdraw anyway. Thank you. Order. Order. New question. Member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Last week, as we know, this government delivered the first balanced budget in nearly a decade. Yay. In it, there are strong examples of how this government is supporting communities and businesses in Northern Ontario. Investing in the North is a critical part of this government's plans to build Ontario up by supporting job creation and creating a dynamic and innovative business climate. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please provide us with examples from the budget of how this government is making life easier for those living in the north? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development and Environment. Speaker, I want to thank the member from, uh, from Barrie for her question. Like uh, those in the province, uh, the north benefited greatly from our investments in the health care system. Uh, Speaker, my main hospital in Thunder Bay, Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre, will see about a $4 million wow. base increase to their budget. Very good news for Thunder Bay Regional. Wow. I know the hospital in Sault Ste. Marie will receive almost a 5% increase in their base wow. funding for the That's hospital in Sault Ste. Marie. Very significant. I want to thank the Minister of Health as well, Speaker. A $10 million increase in the Northern Health Travel Grant, a very significant piece for people right across the north. People may be aware that the basic income pilot will be trialled for three years in Thunder Bay, Speaker, and perhaps the most significant piece in the budget for those of us in the North is an increased Speaker of $100 million, up to a total of $650 million for the Northern Highways program in Thunder Bay and right across Northern Ontario. And I'm going to just Answer. remind the Minister of Transportation to make sure he transfers that money over to the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines so we can do all that Thank great you. work across Northern Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for setting the record straight in this House. I know that Northern Ontario is a top priority for our government, and it is clear that the increase in investments made throughout the North will have a positive impact on communities and businesses in the North. I know we have a long record of investing in Northern Ontario, which clearly continues today, as reflected in this year's budget. But this past week, we heard the opposition making misleading claims about our ongoing support. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Doesn't matter. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please set the record straight? Thank you, Minister. The Speaker, it was with uh, a bit of amusement when I got back to my riding in Thunder Bay and listened to the attempt by the, the critic for the North from, uh, from the opposition party and his attempts to grab a headline. He didn't talk, want to talk about OHIP Plus. That's understandable. He was trying to do a bit of a bait and switch, Speaker, saying that, for way of example, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund was being gutted or declining in terms of his funding. Speaker, very clearly, still $100 million there for the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, also implying that the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines budget was going down. No, Speaker, there was one-time funding in there in 16. That money was no longer uh, needed. Abandoned mine sites were cleaned up. The money no longer required. No reduction in the budget to the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines. But most humorous, I would say, was the criticism by the member that we are no longer making a commitment to the ring of fire, the $1 billion, because it wasn't in the budget. Speaker, in the past, his criticism would have been that another re-announcement, so if it had been in the yes, budget, sir. he would have been criticizing us for putting it in there again, and this time he's trying to criticize us for not having it in there. Thank Speaker, you. we're very committed. The bill Thank you. My resolve hasn't changed. Minister of Health and Middlesex London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, I'm just seeking clarification. Yesterday, during the PC Cox's budget briefing with ministry officials, I asked if the new OHIP Plus drug plan will cover the same items as other government drug plans. How did the ministry respond? They gave me a little coy smile and said, go ask the government. So, Speaker, can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care clarify whether the OHIP Plus drug plan will have the same coverage of drug plans that is for seniors, which is for home care, which is for ODSP, which is for OW. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I 
appreciate the question. It gives me the opportunity to talk about OHIP Plus, our pharmacare, our universal pharmacare program applying to uh, every child and youth in this province uh, 24 years of age or younger. We have a drug formulary in this province. It contains uh, more than 4,000 different medications. Uh, it's science and evidence-based in terms of the drugs that we have on that list. It, it, it involves an entire range, cancer drugs, drugs for rare diseases, the more common prescriptions as well. Uh, and that is the formulary that is made available to our seniors. It's the formulary that's made available to those on Ontario Works. Uh, on ODSP, Mr. Speaker, uh, those on home care is the formulary, the same formulary that will apply uh, for OHIP Plus for children under the age of 25, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Speaker, the Chamber has heard from the Minister of Health and yesterday and from the member of Eglinton Lawrence that OHIP Plus will cover expanded cancer medications and rare disease drugs. However, the government plan for seniors, ODSP, and home care have limited access to cancer medications and rare disease drugs. Many cannot access the drugs they desperately need, which we hear about consistently in this. Stop the clock. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services is warned. Carry Thank on. you. Many cannot access the drugs that they desperately need that we bring to this legislature day in and day out. Oral take-home cancer medications are not covered, nor are the majority of rare disease drugs. Mr. Speaker, will the minister be up front with Ontarians and just tell this chamber that it's the same drug plan that's out there for seniors and home care and OW and ODSP. It's not something special that they're trying to promote to gain their votes. Here, here. Thank you. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, given the professional background of the member opposite, I think he would appreciate and I hope he would agree that it's important that we make our decisions on funding pharmacy uh, uh, prescriptions, Mr. Speaker, uh, drugs prescribed by our doctors and our nurse practitioners, that we make those decisions not uh, in a uh, minister's office, Mr. Speaker, but we make them by, they are made by professionals and experts and clinicians and researchers and academics who truly are expert in those diseases and in those drugs and it's evidence based it's scientific based that we use that approach we take the politics out of the decision making process and that's the basis of establishing the formulary it's the basis of establishing Answer. formularies across the world mr speaker i'm not sure if the member opposite is, is suggesting that we should make every available drug Thank regardless you. of its impact available to Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Speaker, there is no hiding it. There was no mention of the Ring of Fire in the Liberal government's budget. Rien par tout, poemo. Can this government tell us why the Liberals are putting roadblocks in front of the Ring of Fire Infrastructure Development Corporation? Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry that we had the friendly just before the member got up to, to ask his question. I would, I would say the same thing to him as I, as I just did in response to the friendly. Uh, speaker, in the past, that member especially has stood in his place, I would say, on probably more than one occasion and has criticized the government, in his words, for a lack of commitment to the Ring of Fire and a lack of progress on the Ring of Fire, because when it's in a budget, he sees it, frames it, characterizes it, as a re-announcement, when are you going to do something? So this time, Speaker, the money is not allocated, or not allocated is the wrong word, it's not mentioned in the budget, and so the minister or the member this time is simply going to try and say that that represents not a, uh, an interest in... Speaker, quite simply, if it had been in there, the member would be on his feet today criticizing it as a re-announcement. The commitment is there. Everybody knows Answer. that. The people on the ground know that. The stakeholders know that, Speaker, and we're working forward and trying to make progress as best we're able. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Sometimes if he has a question over and over again, the truth finally comes out. I'd like to remind this government. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs told this House on March 28th of this year, just a month ago, that they had put 
$1 billion on the table to develop the Ring of Fire. But apparently, that meant nothing. How did this Liberal government go from investing $1 billion to zero dollars? Because that's what exactly the Liberal budget had for development to this critical job-creating and econ economy-building project. Zero dollars for in sin. Why are the not one cent fire in abandoning all the people and communities who are counting on it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, speaker, thank you again to the member for the question. Of course, it is nonsense. Uh, the premise is unfounded. We are clearly committed and have been for some time to the Ring of Fire. As the Minister of Finance Speaker has just leaned over and reminded me, not only are we committed $1 billion to the Ring of Fire when it comes to infrastructure funding in the province of Ontario, we've increased our overall commitment to infrastructure generally from 160 over 12 years to $190 billion. An additional $30 billion is in this year's budget over the outgoing years to support infrastructure in the province of Ontario. And I've got lots of examples, if I had enough time, where where I could give that member uh, a long laundry list of investments in infrastructure right across northern Ontario in all of the northern Ontario mun municipalities to the benefit of all of the taxpayers in all of those communities. So, Speaker, our commitment is clear. Answer. Our commitment is consistent. Uh, the member continues to try and talk down the ring of fire. We're working very actively on it, and we're hopeful that in the near future we'll have some. Thank you. Your question, the member from Etobicoke North. Monsieur le Président, ma question pour. Thank you. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Youth and Services, Ch Children's Services. Of caring for our children, going beyond mere food, clothing and shelter. In fact, providing supportive, nurturing, safe and secure households so children may reach their potential. Minister, last December, the government introduced Bill 89, the Child, Youth and Family Services Act. As chair of the Justice Policy Committee, I've had the honour of listening to public deputations from Ontarians on Bill 89 and a number of its uh, initiatives and programming. In particular, they focus in on the age of protection changes should the bill pass. This policy, policy change, uh, Speaker, has the potential to positively impact the lives of many vulnerable young Ontarians and support them as they move forward out of care. Question. Particularly important for my folks in Etobicoke North. Minister, can you share with us the details of how the 217-218 budget supports our plan? Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for, from Etobicoke North uh, for this question. Um, I'm so proud of this government's uh, record when it comes to helping young people here in the province of Ontario and setting them up for success. Mr. Speaker, this is a budget that focuses on our children and youth. This budget commits an additional $134 million to child welfare reform to support new initiatives in the sector. This includes, Mr. Speaker, raising the age of protection. If Bill 89 is passed, we hope to implement the provisions related to raising the age of protection by September of this year. Mr. Speaker, this means that if this budget's passed and Bill 89 does pass, starting in September, we will have the funding necessary and the right legislation to begin supporting 16- and 17-year-olds who need care and resources. Mr. Speaker, we estimate that this will help an additional 1,600 young people here in the province of Ontario and set them up for success here in the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, I know that you've, in fact, under the leadership of Premier Wynne, have been working hard to bring forth these uh, important reforms to the child welfare sector. And these reforms, if passed, will have a wide-ranging uh, list of positive impacts for children in care across the province, particularly, Speaker, with regard to the budget. OHIP Plus and the expansion of PharmaCare is something important to the residents of Etobicoke North. This bill, again, if passed, will improve oversight, support consistent services, and address the over-representation of Indigenous and Black youth in the child welfare sector. That's why it's so important that our government make these commitments in the budget and follow through. Uh, speaker, can the minister please tell us about some of the other initiatives that will reform the child welfare sector based on our new budget? Thank you, Minister. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, uh, raising the age of protection is something I believe and this government believes is good for young people here in the province of Ontario. And this budget uh, has a commitment to invest in that area. But we're going to go further than that, Mr. Speaker. We're committing to incorporating new initiatives, such as the creation of the Supporting Families Fund, as well as the implementation of the One Vision, One Voice plan in children's aid societies across the province. One Vision, One Voice is part of our government's commitment to addressing anti-black racism in the child welfare system. This important initiative will assist children's aid societies in delivering more culturally appropriate child protection services. By investing in children and youth in this budget, we're investing into the future of Ontario. I hope all members of this House will show their support for children and youth across this province by supporting a budget that, to the heart, yes, at its heart, takes care of young people here in Ontario. Thank you. Any question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, last month, I appreciated how the minister spontaneously found time in his schedule to meet with a guest of mine for an hour and a half. Today, Speaker, I would like for him to join me in welcoming Joan Black. Joan is here to celebrate her grandson, who is page captain, but she is incidentally a victim of excessive noise and possibly tonal noise generated by industrial wind turbines that the minister's own staff found to maybe outside of noise compliance guidelines. When I brought the good work of the minister's regional staff to his attention a couple of weeks ago, he said no one should suffer. Speaker, in addition to Joan, how many more people, including children and seniors, are demanding answers and action by this government? I have followed up directly with the minister in a letter to set Question. up a suggested meeting, but I have yet to hear back from him. So, given that Joan is here today, could the minister spontaneously find time Thank to you. meet with her as well? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And these things were not spontaneous. As a matter of fact, I make regular trips in the summer to farm communities and to individual farms. And I have been to Chatham-Kent and I've been to Bruce County. I've been throughout Eastern Ontario. I've probably visited over 40 farms to look at issues that they are concerned about, from pesticides to, to greenhouses to turbines. And I spent almost half a day uh, with Mrs. Black's son talking about a number of issues. That wasn't spontaneous. And, and as the member knows, I have never refused a meeting with any Ontarian, and sometimes you can't fit it right in your schedule, but we do that. But Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we see one Ontario. We don't see a rural and an urban Ontario, and ministers even from downtown Toronto send that. And maybe the minister could spend time talking to my constituents, because it's very clear from the member's office that they don't— the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. It's never too late to be named either. Supplementary. Speaker, facts matter. And, and you all, you all saw, you all saw the reaction of Joan Black with the response that we just heard. Shameful. I ask again, Speaker, will the minister take time today to meet with Joan Black from Ashfield, near Godreach? You've got the wrong Mrs. Black, and discuss the letter that she and Carlos Takura sent to him on April 24, explaining how his new protocols still don't cut it. They're not addressing wind speeds. They're not addressing ambient noise. They're not even looking at the total noise inside the house. There's so much to Question. talk about. Will the minister meet with Joan to do today and do the Thank honourable you. thing? You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spe uh, Mr. Speaker. There is a Joan Black from your area who writes me almost on a monthly basis and who my ministry is working with. I apologize for a This helps us understand why they are very good at getting elected as opposition, Mr. Speaker, and not government. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, if I have mistaken the Joan Black, 
for that as another Joan Black event. I wouldn't treat this Joan Black any differently than the other ones. I take these very seriously, Mr. Speaker. We take all of these issues seriously, Mr. Speaker, and we care about all Ontarians. And if there is an issue that I have not addressed properly, Answer. I apologize. I will get on top of it. But whether you're an Indigenous person in Sarnia struggling with benzene and air quality or Thank grassy you. narrows fighting your— Minister of Transportation on the point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. I didn't get the chance at the outset of question period today to introduce Alex Bentz and Nicholas Ferreira, who are both working as interns in my ministry office uh, for the summer. Thank you very much for being here today. Now from London West, point of order. Speaker, I'd like to welcome three students from the Huron University College Political Science Association who have joined us this morning, Emily Abbott, Natalie Cross, and Sean Yock. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Connor Robertson, who's uh, been a longtime resident of Don Valley. So welcome to the legislature. Mr. Infrastructure. I was going to uh, introduce uh, uh, Connor, but uh, they joined us late in the gallery. Two young Ontarians who've joined my office as interns for the summer. Yesterday was their first day at Queen's Park. Please join me in welcoming Connor Robertson and Nicolette Cianos. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also wish to introduce two outstanding interns, Jillian Bevan from Queen's University and uh, Noah Parker from Ryerson. Welcome to Queen's Park and your time at the Ministry of Finance. Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, such a delight to welcome in the gallery uh, Calvin Crack, who is here, and uh, he's from Alexandria, where I had an opportunity to visit on my rural tour, and he is the son of MPP Grant Crack. So hey. welcome. Thank you, Speaker. I just noticed uh, Zunera Asif uh, from my riding of Ottawa Centre here in the uh, in the bench uh, in the gallery. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.